Jesus, Messiah, Teacher, King. This week's memory verse is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John the Baptist lived in the desert, wore clothes made from itchy camel hair, and ate bugs and honey. People were very excited about a new prophet showing up, so they ran out to the desert to see for themselves. John told them to repent from their sins and return to God. As a sign of their repentance, he baptized them in the river. People were so excited, some came to John and asked, are you the Messiah? John said he wasn't the Messiah, but he had a very special message. He said, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. John the Baptist was announcing that the Messiah was almost there. And so who shows up to be baptized? But Jesus himself. So Jesus shows up and asks John to baptize him too. And as Jesus comes up out of the water, the sky opens and the Spirit of God comes down on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven says, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. After being baptized, Jesus disappears into the wilderness for 40 days to spend time alone. And Satan shows up to tempt him. In fact, he answers Satan by quoting God's own words from the Old Testament. He uses God's words to show Satan that he is wrong. After his baptism and temptation in the wilderness, Mark tells us that Jesus went back to Galilee, the place he grew up, saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So Jesus picks 12 men to be his disciples. These guys are really important, and some, like Peter and John, end up writing books that are now in the New Testament. Jesus is teaching in Galilee, and people are amazed at what they hear. He started healing people, people who were sick or blind, people who couldn't walk or who couldn't use one of their hands. Jesus just touched them or even just said a word, and they were healed completely healed. Suddenly, Jesus was surrounded by huge crowds. Everyone wanted to be close to him. Jesus' teaching and miracles were attracting a lot of attention, including the Pharisees, who wanted to know who this new guy was and if he was following all their rules. Healing? That's okay, unless you do it on Saturday, the Sabbath, when you aren't supposed to do any work. Broken rule. Eating dinner? No problem there, unless you didn't wash your hands the right way, or you're eating with tax collectors and people who sin. More broken rules. Jesus knows the Pharisees are watching him, so he does something really wild. There's a man who can't use his legs, can't walk, and needs healing. But instead of healing him, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees go nuts. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he looked right at the Pharisees and said, what is easier, to say to this man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? So you know I have authority to forgive sins. Then he turned to the crippled man and said, get up and walk. And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. He was healed. They got very concerned and decided this Jesus might be a problem. Finally, the Pharisees went to the Sadducees and told them there was a new troublemaker in Israel. Jesus keeps traveling and teaching and healing people. He tells little stories called parables that teach about the kingdom of God. He explains how we should live in this kingdom. He calms a storm on the Sea of Galilee, showing he has authority over nature. He feeds 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, showing he has authority to create abundance out of little. And he even brings a girl back from the dead, showing he has authority even over death. One day Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Who do you think I am? He wants to know if the guys closest to him have figured it out yet. And Peter steps forward and answers, You are the Messiah. 
But now Jesus starts saying things that confuse people. He says in this new kingdom, the first will be last and the last will be first. He says to be a leader in the new kingdom, you'll need to be a servant, like a tiny seed. His own miracles were like tiny little green stems popping out of the ground, the very beginning of something big. And then in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, the kingdom of God will explode in full bloom, renewing and restoring God's creation to be the way he designed it to be in the beginning. So Jesus and his disciples, plus lots of other people from all over Israel, headed to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Many of them had heard about Jesus, and when he entered Jerusalem, a huge crowd came out, laying down their coats and palm branches, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! So Jesus and his disciples gather for the Passover meal, just like all the Jews did every year. But Jesus does something very different that no one expects. First, he says one of his 12 disciples is going to betray him, help the Sadducees and Pharisees grab him and take him away. This freaks everybody out. Then Jesus picks up a piece of the bread they were eating and says, this is my body, which is given for you. Then he picks up the cup they were drinking from and says, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus goes to a garden to pray. He knows what he has to do now, and it isn't going to be easy. After he prays, he turns to his friends and says, The hour has come. And right then his disciple Judas shows up, leading a crowd of guards to arrest Jesus. They put Jesus on trial, first at the Jewish court called the Sanhedrin, run by the Sadducees and Pharisees. His crime? Blasphemy. Saying he was equal to God. His punishment? Death. But the Romans don't let the Sanhedrin put anyone to death themselves, so the members of the court drag Jesus to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And even though Pilate doesn't think Jesus has done anything wrong, he doesn't want the Sadducees and Pharisees to complain about him to Rome like they've done with other governors before him. So he gives in. He washes his hands in front of everyone, a way of saying, this isn't my fault. And he has Jesus killed, crucified, by nailing him to a wooden cross. As Jesus is dying, he looks up to heaven and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Suddenly the sky grows dark and Jesus dies. The curtain in the temple rips from top to bottom. The Roman guard standing closest to Jesus sees all this and says, surely this man was the son of God. The people around Jesus just saw a man dying on a cross, but that's not what God saw. God saw something very different happening. God saw his son, the son of God, on a cross. Then he saw the stain of our sin appearing on Jesus. Your sin, my sin, everything selfish and mean we've ever done or ever could do. The stain of all that sin was appearing on Jesus, even though he'd never done anything wrong at all. God saw his son stained with all the sin of the world. He saw him buried under all that sin. He saw him die under all that sin. And since the punishment for all that sin is death, death away from God, that's how Jesus died, alone, away from God. The last thing Jesus said was, God, God, why have you left me alone? On Sunday morning, two women who were followers of Jesus went to the tomb and discovered something incredible. It was empty. The huge stone that blocked the entrance had been rolled away and Jesus wasn't there. Matthew and Luke both tell us that the women meet an angel who says Jesus is no longer dead. He's alive. They didn't have to take the angel's word for it though, because Jesus appears right in front of them, living, walking around and talking. And then Jesus appears to his disciples, and then to more than 500 people. Jesus proved that he had authority over death itself. And then, according to Luke, Jesus blesses his disciples, 
and disappears into the clouds. <laughs>